welcome to Lahana High School's Tigers Talking on the Prairie. This is just an experiment that my senior English class is doing. They're looking at their writing, they're talking about the process, and then sharing their written work. It's an effort to expand our audiences, to find a real world audience. It's an opportunity for us to get out there on the internet and shape the world. So we hope you enjoy this Tigers Talking on the Prairie. I'm Michael Lee, and I'm a senior at Lahana High School. My name is Antonio Medina, and I'm a senior here at Lahana High School. My name is Annie Ray, and I'm a senior at Lahana High School. My name is Casey, and I'm a senior at Lahana High School. We will be explaining how we went through the process of writing our narrative essays. First step we took in writing narrative essays is we looked at models of other people's essays and annotated them to find the key points as a group. The second step we took was to brainstorm of ideas to write about. We narrowed them down to three ideas and then from those three ideas we chose one of them. The third step we took in this process was writing our rough draft. Fourth step we took was the peer evaluation. They told us our strong and weak points, they pointed out our mechanical errors, and gave us ideas on improvement. The fifth step we took in writing our narrative essays was writing our second draft, which we took our peer evaluation into consideration and wrote our second draft. Our sixth step we took was going on the criterion and typing our essays. We revised the mistakes it pointed out. The final step was after all our final revisions were done, we printed our paper in the correct format and turned it in. Backpacking by Annie Ray. Where the sky is always blue and the birds are always singing, you are the state that I call my home, Montana. It is very like people to explore the wondrous wilderness of this state. I have taken many adventures there. One in particular I call my favorite, backpacking in the Spanish Peaks, which is located in Bozeman, Montana. My best friend, camp counselor, and some other happy campers came along as well. When we arrived at the beginning of the trail, Josh, my camp counselor, announced about the challenges we would be facing. He talked about the bears and the animals that could put us in danger. He also talked about the plant life and how not to eat anything he didn't approve of because we could have a chance of getting poisoned. What we didn't think about that would be a problem was the weather because the forecast said it would be bright and sunny. We finally started hiking up the trail and made about five, six miles when the dark, ominous clouds rolled in. We figured it was nothing. We had decided to pitch our tents and camp on the side of the trail because it was getting dark and didn't want to get caught in the rain. It started sprinkling so the wood to build a fire was damp, but we managed. We still had a great time despite the rain. We made s'mores and told horror stories about creatures that could eat us and crunch on our, crunch on our bones in the dead of night. The rain started to pick up, so we all went to our tents to go to sleep. I hadn't even been asleep two hours when we awoke from the intense thunder and lightning. I was a little scared. It sounded like pieces of the mountain were crumbling down. We all had huddled around the biggest tent and tried to wait it out. When morning arrived, it was still raining. He gave us a choice, go back, go back down the mountain or continue up. We wanted to stick it out and continue. We started up the mountain again, rain and all. The cold ground was muddy and the rocks were dripping with water. As we continued to, the rock, to walk, the rain kept getting worse and worse. So we decided to stop under a big rock and wait until the rain slowed down. As we all sang songs and danced around for an hour until the rain stopped. When it stopped, we all got back on our backpacks and started up the mountain again. The ground was still muddy, so our shoes were heavy and dripping with mud and grass. We kept pushing through because we really wanted to make see this crystal blue lake We've been waiting to see this whole time. As we got closer, I could see myself sitting by the lake with a pole in hand, just fishing. We kept pushing through. The weather started up to clear up, and we could all smell the lake and the wonderful, wonderful trees around us. We finally achieved our destination through all the obstacles and bad weather we had. We set up our campsite and dived right into the bright blue sparkling lake. The outcome was worth it. Where the sky is always blue and the birds always singing. We're the state that I call my home, Montana. My name is Antonio Medina and this is my story broken. As I walked through that dark tunnel, I could feel that cold tear run down my face. Once those bright lights of the stadium caught my eye, all I could do was ask, dear God, why? Why did this happen, have to happen to me? How far back is it going to send me? But all I know is that I wanted to know is why. I think this broke me even worse than before. It was the start of my junior year of wrestling and I was ready to compete and battle my way back to the state tournament in place like I had always dreamed of. But that dream soon became a nightmare that I'd never seen coming. A sharp pain covered my left arm. This pain in my arm was as if someone was driving a thousand nails in my arm. Could this be? Did I break it? I couldn't have. The doctor said it was pull tendons. But what was that sharp snap? Was I the only one that heard it? How and why is Michael staring at me like if something was wrong? Oh crap, it broke. So there I was trying to understand what was going to happen with my wrestling season. 
and that's when my doctor came back in the ER. The bone was completely broke. There is an inch gap between his bone, he said. He will also need surgery. So there I was trying to understand what the heck is going to happen. I was so confused and lost, but somehow I finally understood that my season was completely gone. There was no turning back. I am stuck watching my teammates and my best friend wrestle the whole season and me sitting on the sides of the mat dying just a little bit every time I watch a new match start. So the big day finally came. The state championship was here. Me and my me in the first of my month started recovery. I was so excited to see who was going to win at my weight class and who was going to be my competition for next year. I thought and I had finally accepted my injury, but no. Once I walked through the tunnel, it seemed all my dream had came true and it, I could do was cry. For now, my new dream is to make it to the state championships in place and show everyone that I am back and more ready and determined than ever before. No one can take my spot on that podium. Nothing will stop me. I will come back. On Your Marks by Michael Lee. State track is indescribable. There's so much talent, so much to see, and so much to do. I've never seen so many people in one place before, and it was all to watch people run, jump, and throw. Every couple minutes, a new race began with the sound of the gun. Each shot, meaning my race was getting closer. I was completely quiet, just sitting with my team, observing the competition, and completely lost in thought. All I could think about was what I could do wrong. If I moved a little in the blocks, we'd be disqualified. If I fall started, we're disqualified. If I don't get the handoff to Joel, we're disqualified. There were dozens of situations that flashed through my mind, and all of them were of myself getting us disqualified. We're at Jeffco Stadium in the middle of Denver. The stadium was bigger than anyone I had ever seen before. There were literally thousands of people packed into the stands. At one point, the announcer told the crowd there were over 6,000 people in the stadium. The stands were littered with tents and umbrellas to keep people out of the sun so they wouldn't get drained of all their energy. Except us. Lanta had no tent and no umbrella. We sent the bleachers together as a unit. And if we didn't have our uniforms on, you'd never know we were there to compete. Unlike other teams, we don't put up a big show for intimidation. We let our actions do the talking because what you do echoes for eternity. What you say can always be forgotten. Around three, Bubs and I headed down the, to the warm-up area. It was a small patch of grass, maybe about the size of a basketball court, and it was chained off to everyone except those who were competing. I showed them the stamp that branded us as an athlete, and the man led us into the field. I saw several other teams that were in our classification, teams that we were going to run against. I felt like you could cut the tension with a knife. It was all about intimidation. Teams were trying as hard as they could to look as if they had been doing this all their lives. As they warmed up, Bubs and I stared down the, were stared down the entire time. We were ranked higher than most of the teams, although they had it, the intimidation factor. Bubs and I were both about five foot six. Bubs is pretty stocky, and I'm built lean but muscular. While the other teams were all around six foot and rippling with muscle, they looked like state athletes, while Bubs and I looked more like little kids. We just laughed them off, though, because we both knew we were faster than they were. The announcer came out to the PA and said, Finals for the 4 by 100 meter relay, Class A, is now on the track. Bubs and I headed over to the field where Joseph and Joel were already waiting for us. We huddled together and began to talk ourselves up. We talked about doing better than we were supposed to and placing high. After, get, after getting ourselves pumped up, it was time to head to our separate sections. I headed towards the finish line where I would start a race. I start a race is because I'm faster than everyone else on the team out of the blocks by quite a bit. It was something I was good at. Even our fastest kid couldn't beat me in the first 40 meters. I began to stretch out my legs a little more. Then I heard it. On your marks, blasted from the starter's megaphone. My stomach started churning, and I took one last look at the crowd. I scanned the entire stadium slowly, letting it all sink in. I took a deep breath and lowered myself into the blocks, coiling my legs up like a spring. They felt like they were ready to explode. My whole body was shaking. Even my breath was a little shaky. I closed my eyes and pictured myself doing what it is I'm supposed to do. Set. I cocked myself up and started breathing harder. 
Adrenaline started to flow through my veins and I could feel everything start to slow down. I opened my eyes. Bang. Crack. Like the crack of a bat hitting a heater down the pipe. I witnessed my brother just die. Or so I thought. I knew he was following too closely to the calf as he ran it down the alley. Once the calf hit the chute, his hind legs rose up and bam, lights out for shade. If he would have been closer, it wouldn't have been a problem. He could have pushed the calf back down, but he couldn't reach, and this mistake might have been his last. The night before the branding, I was ecstatic to go see my family. My dad told me that I was finally old enough to help. I was very nervous. I had always been too young, too little to help, but not this time. Grandpa told us at, to be at the ranch at 5 a.m., so we would have time to wake up. <laughs> Extra early, I was determined to show my skills off to Grandpa. I had my raggedy old Wranglers with the many holes they had earned over the years and my boots laid out. I laid in bed, even though I knew I wouldn't sleep. I woke my brothers up bright and early, ran down the stairs to help my dad pack the car. We were taking lunch supplies and clothes. The hour and a half drive flew by. Uh, my mind was racing. I couldn't wait to help. When we got there, my uncles and aunts had their horses saddled up and ready to ride out, even one for my dad. The horses were groomed and all prettied up for the ride. She was standing with Aunt Holly, gleaming in the sunrise. Her red fur seemed to glow auburn in the sun. Our eyes met when I got out of the car. She knew it was our day. She's all yours, Aunt Holly said with a smile. What? I said puzzled. I rode her around in the corral playing with the cows, but I never got the chance to ride out. Uncle Terry's back's messed up, so you're going to have to ride out, Grandpa said with a nod. I was speechless. As I climbed in the saddle, the butterflies started to get to me. This was the first time that I was allowed to ride out. When we rode out of the corral and rounded up the cattle with ease, Dad said it was the easiest it had ever been. When we got back to the corral, they started running the calves down the chute. Surprisingly, when I... Looked in the krill, I saw Shane running the calves down. I thought to myself, that was a horrible idea because he's so slow. But Grandpa knows best. Well, later in the afternoon, Shane had to have had to have run 50 calves down the chute without any problems. But one of the littlest calves, he spooked down the chute, and it took off faster than he was. It hit the chute, and its hind legs reared up. And bam, right in the kisser, kick, kick Shane in the face. As Shane laid in the du dust, screaming, holding his face with blood pouring through his fingers, Grandma shouted at me to go get him. I ran over to the chute and pulled Shane up. He said he was fine and ran out of the chute. Well, now I guess it was my time to shine. All in all, I guess it was a good day. We ran some calves down the chute, and I got to prove myself to Grandpa. I think that's a good day's work. This has been Tigers Talking on the Prairie, a senior English project at Lahana's Junior Senior High School in La Hunta, Colorado.